Welcome, fellow true crime enthusiasts, to today's case file, Unbreakable Courage, Fighting the Enemy Alone, Caitlin Babb's story. Welcome to Body of Crime, your go-to true crime podcast, where we plunge headfirst into the gripping world of criminal mysteries. Join your hosts, Jose Medina, Crystal Garcia, and Alicia Anaya, as we deliver the full stories, immersing you in the heart of each case. With spine-chilling cases, in-depth analysis, captivating interviews, and a comprehensive examination of the evidence, embark on a thrilling journey with us as we explore bone-chilling cases from around the globe. Whether you're a seasoned true crime enthusiast or a fresh face in the genre, we guarantee to keep you on the edge of your seat. So put on your detective hat, grab your notepad, and get ready to dive into the thrilling world of body of crime. If you've never heard Caitlin's story, brace yourself, because what you're about to hear is something no parent ever wants their child or children to experience. Caitlin's injustice was thrust into the spotlight when her abuser, a convicted rapist and registered sex offender, committed a murder-suicide that left at least two minor girls sexually assaulted and seven people dead. The kicker? His last message was sent to Caitlin. I did exactly what I promised you I would do when I got out. I got a marketing job making great money, and was being advanced, been there two years now, and made a great life like I promised I would do with you. Now it's all gone. I told you I wouldn't go back. This is all on you for continuing this. The Oklahoma justice system, a broken system that had already dragged Caitlin's case out more than 2,000 days, just shy of five and a half years, burning through at least five district attorneys, repeatedly re-victimized Caitlin with every handoff of her case. The district attorneys handling Caitlin's case failed her. The judges presiding over Caitlin's case failed her. The justice system failed her. The Oklahoma Department of Corrections failed her. And her abuser's family failed her. Caitlin was left to fight the enemy alone. But her victimization does not define her or who she is. You will learn about the real Caitlin today and why she is truly a survivor and an advocate for justice and change. Twenty-nine million. That's how many reports of suspected child exploitation are received by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children annually. That is over half a million reports per week. Eighteen percent. That's the percentage of child sexual abuse material content that stems from online enticement. Twenty-five percent. That's the percentage of family, friends, and neighbors who produce child sexual abuse material content. Eighteen percent. That's the percentage of parents who produce child sexual abuse material content. When Caitlin's case became an all-access spectacle, people said some very cruel things because of their ignorance and lack of understanding. Women are groomed. Men are groomed. Children are groomed. Though research has shown risk factors that may increase the potential for exposure to sexual abuse, sexual abuse knows no bounds. When a photo or a video is distributed, It stretches far beyond a single incident of abuse resulting in trauma that bleeds into adulthood. The offenders are generally someone that they know and trust. Caitlin's abuser, like many others, used grooming tactics to normalize sexual contact and encourage secrecy. If this seems unfathomable to you, remember those offender statistics. And welcome to the Body of Crime podcast. And we appreciate, Caitlin, that you chose to share your story with us. We know that you could have shared this with any other number of podcasts. So we really appreciate you choosing to share your story with us. And we want to tell your story and share your truth with our audience and and with the world. Yeah, welcome, Caitlin. Thank you, guys. So where did you grow up? 
we always start at the beginning. We always start with where you grew up. <laughs> <laughs> so I was born in Edmond, Oklahoma. And whenever my parents divorced, uh, whenever I was two, I moved to a small town in North Texas. And that's, that's where I grew up. So I spent most of my childhood years was there. Do you like Oklahoma or Texas better? Well, I was two, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> when you're two, it's like everything is great. <laughs> when you were living in North Texas, I, I'm assuming that's where you began, like elementary school. And did, did you stay there into middle school? Yes, I did. I stayed there into middle school until the eighth grade okay. and then at that point I actually moved to Norman Oklahoma to live with my grandparents and I started high school there when you were going to school in elementary school um how was that for you like what was that experience like for you all throughout elementary school and, and middle school I did fairly well I was a pretty smart kid in elementary school I believe from the beginning of kindergarten I took all gifted and talented classes. So you were really School. smart. <laughs> yeah. I was always teacher's pet. <laughs> I was a very good kid. I never got in any trouble. <laughs> I never did anything. <laughs> did you do any type of sports or anything like that or any hobbies? No sports. Um, I wasn't very athletic. My very last year in Texas, in the eighth grade in middle school, I did cheerlead. Okay. That is the extent of my sports history. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't very talented in those areas. I did a lot of reading, and I liked to play the guitar, listen to music, things like that. Do you sing? Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> How was cheerleading for you? How did you like that? I enjoyed it. It's the first time I'd ever done anything on a team. So it was a new experience, you know, kind of have to be friends or, you know, close to people who you may not already know or, you know, trust. You have to form a type of connection with them. So I enjoyed it. When you got to Oklahoma and you started school in Norman, how did you like that school? Was that a good experience for you, high school? Starting high school in Norman was very different because I grew up in such a small town. And Norman itself has multiple high schools just for the city of Norman. So it was definitely a change. And uh, there were so many kids, and the quality of education there is very poor. It's, it, you know, I had some classes actually in high school that didn't even have a teacher. Wow. Um, they would just put a video on in the room and then leave no during way. that period. Yes, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> he actually, day one, handed us all of the quizzes that the state said she was required to give us for the entirety of the year and told us do all of them and just give them to me at some point by, by the end of the year. That's all that you need to do. And I maybe saw her three times. Wow. Yeah, that's crazy. I've never heard of that. <laughs> yeah. And you know, the textbooks that they would give us, you could tell were close to 10 years old. I mean, they wouldn't have front or back covers. <laughs> yeah, um, it's sad, but it's the truth of you know the Oklahoma school system. There's just no funding that goes there, so you really don't get the <laughs> the experience that you should when you're trying to learn. Yeah, it was definitely a change. How was it making friends in high school? It was hard. You know, I was in a completely different place. I 
would, of course, visit my grandparents during the summers, but I didn't know anybody there. And everybody else seemed to already have their circles of friends. I would say for probably the first year and a half of going to high school there, I actually sat on the floor in sort of like the hallway that led into the lunchroom area for the first year and a half and ate lunch on the floor alone. (laughs) Nobody, not even one person would even stop to talk to me. Would you consider yourself an outgoing person or were you kind of like more introverted? Yeah, I would probably consider myself introverted, more so shy, maybe, or reserved. It takes me a while to open up to people and, you know, be able to be myself and, you know, who I truly am. So if someone's talking to me for the very first time, I may not come off as my genuine self. Right. That makes sense. So at what point did you meet McFadden? Was it when you were in high school? Yes. I was a sophomore high school. That's the very first time that I had communicated with him. And how did that take place? He actually sent a text message to my cell phone. That's the very first interaction that we ever had. I know that we've talked before. I didn't realize that you had been at the high school for almost a year and a half before you even had a conversation with McFadden. And when you were saying, like, I didn't have any friends, I didn't realize it had been that long of a time period where you're isolated and you're pretty lonely. Like, that's a really long time to be live somewhere without any friends. I didn't realize you were a sophomore. Yeah, I had friends back from Texas that would come when they could and yeah. visit, you know, just, like, spend the weekend with me. But other than that, it was difficult for me, for sure. And how old were you at that point in time? I would have been 16. 16. So we know that that when McFadden originally reached out to you, he was actually reaching out to somebody else named Shannon, I believe. Had he messaged you several times before maybe you answered? Or was it just, I know that you were getting a bunch of different messages for somebody else because it was a new number for you. What kind of made you want to even answer him back, I guess? I don't know. And I've thought about it before myself, you know, what what made me respond. (laughs) The text message was innocent, just, hey, you know, this is Jesse, how are are you doing? And I guess it had just been over this period of time, so many messages I had gotten. And it was pretty late at night, you know, late in the evening. So I just decided to text back because I don't believe that number had ever texted me before or called me. That was the first time that I knew of. I know that when, because I did look up that phone number, I was just curious to know who the person was that had the phone. And I know that some of the things that came up for that person were kind of weird. And you're talking about the phone that Caitlin had? The phone phone number, number, yeah. Yeah, the Caitlin, okay. I was able to find her. She passed away, I want to say like in April of 2020. But something interesting that came up when I put her phone number in was some stuff came up like some escort type stuff, like escort business type stuff, which is kind of strange. So it makes it interesting that of all numbers, like that he reached out to that phone number and then he gets Caitlin on the other end of that phone number that no longer belongs to Shannon. And the reason I thought about that, because one of the things that I was thinking about when I heard that he had just reached out randomly was, did he get the telephone number from another inmate? Because he had a tendency to go through people's stuff and get contacts from other people. So I was thinking, well, maybe somebody had that telephone number in prison and he saw it somewhere. And then that's why he reached out. You know, later on, then when we found out that it was this person's previous number, then that made a lot more sense because he probably was reaching out to Shannon and inadvertently connected with Caitlin. 
So in the beginning of that communication, it sounds like it was very normal, you know, like, hey, how are you doing? At what point did you kind of feel like maybe... I wanted to know how that conversation just kind of evolved. Can you tell us about like how that, let's say that first week of communication between you and McFadden? The first week, I mean, of course, it started off normal that very first night. Yeah. Um, I was responded, this isn't Shannon. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> you know, why are you texting this number? And I believe he had said that she was a friend. Mm. He asked who I was, and I told him my name. And it was kind of just suddenly meeting, talking to someone for the first time type of conversation, asking where are you from or, you know, where do you live? And general things about each other. I did ask him how old that he was, and he did tell me. And I believe at the time he was 31 or 32. Yeah. And he did ask me how old I was during this first text message conversation that night. And I told him that I was 16. And his reaction was he was acting as if he didn't believe me he was like i what i want you to do is write my name down on a piece of paper and hold it up next to your face and take a picture and you know at the time it just seemed like another stranger who had just met another stranger by communicating via texting and they just wanted to make sure that i was a real person and not, you know, who knows, somebody pranking them or, you know, somebody completely different than what I had described myself to be. Um, so I did it. And I believe I also sent him a picture of my, at the time it would have been my learner's permit. Mm. I was 16, learning to drive. So he knew from day one then how old you were. And you knew how old he was. Yes. Did you feel weird? Were you thinking like, this is a 30-year-old? Like, what was your, your thought initially? Yes. I, of course, there was that feeling of it being uncomfortable. Honestly, I, in my head, it was an interaction that I was having with somebody who I was never going to have another interaction with again. Right. So, so like, I knew what what all of this was going to end up to be. And, you know, that was kind of my frame of mind or my, you know, where my headspace was at the time. And it felt nice to have somebody who was talking to me and who was interested in knowing about me. Right. At that point where you were connecting with Jesse and you guys were starting to communicate prior to that, had you been in any other relationships prior? I had a boyfriend whenever I was like maybe 13. Yeah. <laughs> that's not a real boyfriend. <laughs> I would imagine, you know, that's just like movies and popcorn yeah. and uh, a first kiss type of deal. But right. no, I, I never had a serious boyfriend. You know, the move from Texas to Oklahoma and then I didn't even have friends. Right. So, no, like, I hadn't ever had those type of experiences before. Yeah. I think that's important to understand, but you've never been in a relationship before. You are very isolated and probably a little depressed because you aren't socializing. And, and then here comes this guy who's showing you some interest and originally it starts off very innocent. And it's just a conversation between two strangers. Yeah. And there's been plenty of times where someone has texted me and I'll respond as well. I've done that before. So I can understand how it can easily happen and where you disconnect with someone and then it's really easy to kick off because you don't, you're not in person. It's easier to not be shy. Yeah. That's kind of like when you get catfished online. Yeah. Kind of like that. I was catfished, Caitlin. Really? Caitlin, he, she's. <laughs> this, this guy you hear <laughs> had a picture posted <laughs> with hair <laughs> and green eyes. And the guy I met was bald with brown eyes. <laughs> it, it was, it was an old picture. Oh, 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> totally understand how that can happen. So your first week is very innocent and friendly and just getting really to know each other, but you're sharing personal information about yourself and he's sharing personal information about himself. And so at some point, there's some type of a connection there and some type of emotional investment between you and, and McFadden. And how did that begin to escalate from just friends and just wanting to know each other to then it becoming a little bit more romantic or more emotional? How did it become more emotional? Really, unfortunately, the first request I got from him for me to send him explicit photos of myself was the same night that I had initially answered his text message. You know, and I know that blows people's minds, but I just, I, I didn't know that I was talking to a monster. It was just somebody behind a screen. I, I didn't understand and I didn't want to comply. I know I told him several times no or, you know, tried to push it off and we would continue the conversation and he would ask again. And I replied eventually, and I, I did send him photos of myself. How long were you guys in your conversation before he took it there? Maybe, I mean, probably four hours. And in four hours, you can have a pretty lengthy conversation. So yeah. You can really learn a lot about each other. Did he tell you, like, where he was at? Because we know he was in prison, like, where he was from, any of that? Yeah, he asked where I was from, and I said that I lived in Norman. And I asked him where he lived, and I believe he either told me that he lived in Lexington, or he could have told me that he lived in McAllister. But there was no indication of him being incarcerated, or that he was texting me from prison. And I never received any photos from him mm -hmm. that night. So I had no idea. You before he asked for for that photo, did he ask for like normal photos? I know he asked for the one originally where he had you hold up the paper, but like, did he have any requests prior to that before he asked for that type of photo? Yeah, pictures of, of me, just what I looked like, uh, normal. Right. Photos. You know that doesn't come off as strange, especially for a young girl when you've been talking for a few hours, you're not thinking anything of it. There's actually a show on Netflix called Push, and it goes through a series of things where it shows you with a grown adult how when you're getting somebody to do something and you're slowly escalating what you're asking them to do, eventually they do it, you know, like they start small and then they ask you to do something bigger and then bigger. And that's kind of how it starts. It's a perfect example of grooming because one of the methods of persuasion is consistency. When you ask someone to do something small and they do it, you ask them to do something that's maybe a little bit, you know, bigger than that. Like, for example, if I say, hey, hand me that piece of paper and you hand it to me. And then I say, hey, can you go out to my car and, and bring me something from my trunk? You're probably going to go do it because you've already done something for me. It's more likely that you'll go out there and do that as well. And then the higher you escalate that, the more and more the person is feeling responsible to do what you're asking them to do. And it seems like McFadden was good at this. He was good at getting you to do small things and then escalating that and then escalating his emotion when you don't follow through as well. So it's a little scary. For sure. After that first night, like what did he try to tell you to get you to see him as being somebody that you wanted to continue talking to or anything of that nature? He was very nice to me, very sweet and caring. And it seemed like he genuinely cared about the type of person I was and learning more about me. So he, he asked questions that were personal and in, in-depth questions. You know, it wasn't just surface area stuff. It was meaningful conversations. And he also told me things about himself you know, that were also meaningful and deep. We had uh, many conversations like that almost every night, just like connecting with each other. He seemed normal. And I liked the idea of somebody who was showing me attention and showing me that they cared about me and that they wanted to talk to me. 
you guys were talking for, was it like a couple of weeks before it became a little bit more romantic or was it pretty early on? Probably pretty early on. I think after that first night and he was able to get me to comply with a request that he probably thought was a reach because <laughs> yeah. uh, it was, I think that he, he wasn't the type to hold back. Yeah. <laughs> so um, he was bold. He was bold. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure there were parts of the conversation that were romantic. And like I said, he was sweet to me saying, you know, telling me I was beautiful and just saying things that were loving and comforting. And so, yes, there were sort of, you know, talks of as if you were in a relationship with that person. That, yeah. That's how he would communicate with me during the rest of that first week and in our time went on. And did you share with anybody else about this relationship or is this something that you kept pretty much to yourself or is this something that you shared with maybe some of your friends from North Texas? And did he want you to keep it a secret? I definitely kept it from my grandparents. About around the same time that I met him, I actually found a friend. Her name is Kylie. She's my best friend in high school. And I was hesitant about saying anything to her about him he actually asked me to or encouraged me to he wanted her to know that he was in my life and in what way he was in my life and also to be honest with her and share about the fact that he was incarcerated and how did that make you feel that he wanted you to share about his existence and your in your relationship i feel like it just validated my feelings, made it feel more real, you know, that it wasn't just some person who I was texting on the phone, you know, now I have this friend that knows about it, you know, and then through her, I meet other people and they become, you know, close friends and tell them and it made it more of a factor in my life when I brought it from the phone into the real world. Right. That makes a lot of sense. And that's also... A manipulation in terms of encouraging you to be honest and truthful and that the purpose is to add substance to the relationship and to say hey I want you to be honest and I want you to, in that act you feel that other person is also being honest so it causes you to trust them more because it's not like hey I want you to keep hiding this if he would have said that you would have been a little bit like skeptical about it and be like oh why am I a secret and am I doing something wrong by putting it out into the universe and putting it out into real life now it feels right. It feels like it's okay. And it feels like it's a real relationship. That's true. That makes a lot of sense, actually. At what point did he come out and tell you that he was in prison? And how did that conversation go? It would have been early on, but not right away. I would say, and not within the first week. I mean, maybe after a week, to two weeks of talking to him. And, you know, this guy had never sent me a picture of himself. As, you know, maybe he did, but he would say it's an old picture. <laughs> um, <laughs> was he 10? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even think of that. I didn't even think of like, you know, when you guys share pictures back and forth. I didn't even yeah. think of it. That's so funny. But, you know, I'd never seen a picture of him that was recent. And he wasn't able to talk on the phone and the communication wasn't consistent you know during the day I wouldn't hear from him at all maybe here and there at times but it wasn't ever anything like it was in the evening what would he tell you he was doing during the day I'm sure he just said he was working but I don't remember exactly what he said is that became a point in which it made me start to be unsure. I had been extremely open and honest and truthful. And yes, I'm holding up a sign of your name next to my face. <laughs> right. You know, this person seems to not want to share very much information. And, you know, he was older. I started to wonder, you know, is he married? You know, what is he hiding from me? And I, I know that I asked questions and... There was a point eventually when I got a message from him and he was like, 
hey, there's something I need to tell you, but I don't want to tell you. I'm afraid of what your reaction is going to be. And I was like, why? You know, what What do you mean? Just tell me. And he was like, well, I don't want you to leave. You know, I don't want to scare you away. At this point, are you thinking, oh, no, he's married? <laughs> yeah, that was probably the worst case scenario that I had yeah. in my head. Or actually, I'm a 62-year-old <laughs> man that lives in Alaska. <laughs> I mean, it was really my, oh, my God. <laughs> A 62-year Eskimo. (laughs) (laughs) Right. I really had no idea. At this point, you know, I got to know. So I, you know, like, I want to know. Tell me. And he said that he was in prison. And that's how he had been communicating with me the whole time was from prison. And I know that I asked him why. And he told me a half-truth. He did tell me why he was incarcerated and what for. Uh, the way in which he explained it, you know, I later on found out that wasn't the truth. But he did tell me it was for rape. How did he explain that to you? You know, it shared with me his life until that point. And, you know, that he had been using drugs. And he had said that they were at a party together and that they had started to have sex and it seemed fine. And then all of a sudden that the girl decided that she didn't want to anymore and that she wanted him to stop. And uh, he said that he complied and overall that he said it was consensual. I guess after she left or after she went home, then... Then he found out that, you know, she had made this report. And at that age, I'm sure you don't know about all the different things that you can go in and look at to, like, fact check his story. So you're probably just taking him at his word. Right. Yeah. I would say it's easy to take him at his word because he's being vulnerable. It sounds like he's telling you the truth. Why would he lie about raping somebody? It almost feels like he's giving you a half truth and he's just dressing it up, making it look nice. I'm not a bad guy. I had a bad situation and it's it's a misunderstanding. How did that make you feel? Were you thinking in that moment, God dang it, I wish he was married. (laughs) I wish that was the big news. Yeah, I definitely was not in any way expecting it to be that. I had no idea. There was nothing that could have ever prepared me for him to say that. It was scary. I felt scared. I had thoughts of, wow, I told this person where I live and they know what I look like. I was definitely scared. There was a period of time after he told me actually that I, I didn't respond to him. I didn't text him back. The intentions of never communicating with him again. How long did you go before you did communicate back with him again? And what caused you to give him that second chance? It was probably a few days, two to three days. And throughout that time period, he was still texting me, even though I wasn't responding. And and there were things that seemed very sweet and genuine, you know, that he really liked me and he didn't want me to leave. He just wanted to to talk to me. He said, we can talk about this. You you can ask me any questions that you want. I'll tell you anything you want to know. Telling me, you know, that I was the sweetest person and that I was so beautiful and basically telling me everything I want to hear. He knew at this point was the moment that I was either going to leave and never come back or he was going to be able to lure me back in and that you know after that point it was going to be hard for me to walk away it was the point of no return right if he was able to do everything he had done up to that point and I was still going to come back then he knew that I mean he had it in the bag right so he was giving it his all everything he could possibly say you know that he could see himself you know marrying me or having a relationship with me and just everything yeah <laughs> 
I just gave in and I sent him a text message and I know that we talked about his charge and, you know, I'm sure I asked him some more questions, but it just kept on going from that day. After that day, how did the relationship evolve? Did it become more intense? Did it stay about the same or how did it evolve? Yeah, it gradually became more. I mean, it went from what felt like gradually for me, but looking back on it, it was a pretty aggressive, you know, as far as the time frame in which things escalated. So, you know, it went from, I want you, you know, take your shirt off and take a picture to being fully naked or even videos, everything that you could imagine eventually he asked for. And it was a similar situation to the very first time I would say, you know, I don't want to do that. That sounds embarrassing or makes me feel uncomfortable or because I was a shy kid, <laughs> you know, and, right. I, you know, and having never had those experiences with anybody else, it was a lot. And he would have to convince me that yeah. he was very good with comforting me and consoling me, comforting those fears that I had to make me feel as if I could trust him and that to make me feel like it was something that I wanted. I would give in and then, you know, the next three or four requests, I would give in easier and easier and easier until it just became habit of him requesting sexual things from me. And, of course, at some point, there was some hesitation because, like I said, he would, he would ask for anything and everything. So. There were times that I didn't want to, but you couldn't tell him no. And at this point, I'm assuming like you've fallen in love with this guy at this point and you're thinking like we're going to get married. Like you're thinking that you guys have this permanent future. I'd be careful with saying that. I, I think what she fell in love with was the concept of him. Right. Yeah. Because really she doesn't know him at this point. No. She, she knows what he wants her to know at this point. Right. Is that kind of how you felt? Yeah. I believe probably within the first month, we were telling each other that we loved each other. I definitely felt like I loved him and I felt like he loved me and cared about me in that same way. You know, to me, he was somebody that came to me when I needed somebody and when I was alone. So, yeah, I, I had very strong feelings for him. I, I didn't realize that you know, although he might have had those feelings for me as well, it wasn't with as pure of intentions as mine were. Your friend that you told about him, did she know like his age? Did she know he was in prison? Did she know any of that information at the time? Yeah. You know, I moved to where he would call me and we would talk on the phone and he was very controlling. So anytime he called... <laughs> I was supposed to answer the phone, you know, whether she was around or not. And we would talk on the phone in front of her. Uh, there were times that I'm sure they talked to each other, honestly. And, you know, she actually was at that point in her life for the very first time a foster kid. So he knew that she wasn't going to run home and tell mom and dad about Caitlin at school. <laughs> mm. So he didn't hold back as far as wanting to, you know, wanting me to share information with her and also about him being a part of not only my life, but our friendship. Do you think there was some kind of motive behind that? Yes, I do. I believe that I peaked it progressed to where at some point he was actually requesting that I do things with her sexually and not just do them, but of course he wanted to either watch it or for me to record it. And that was the very last <laughs> thing that I just was like, Nope, <laughs> you know, I'm 
I'm just not going to do that. I don't feel comfortable doing that. You're crazy. You know, there's no way. And I'm sure that he even suggested things to her about it as well. Um, you know, just trying to manipulate us both into doing it, right. even though we both, of course, were uncomfortable with that if we said no. There was also another instance with a friend of mine from middle school, actually, that I've been communicating with, and we would just text me and her. And since he had access to certain parts of my phone, he knew about her and wanted to speak to her as well. There was a point that he actually requested and received sexually graphic pictures from her as well. And we grew up together, so she was my age. So basically what he was doing was he was using you as a networking opportunity to connect with all your friends. Right. And you said he was monitoring your phone, so he probably had access to all your phone numbers. Yeah. Um, he had a an app downloaded on my phone that he requested I download, you know, because he was very jealous. You know, I kind of chalked it up to the idea of he's in there and he has no idea what I'm doing out here. And that's where his trust or jealousy issues stem from. But he requested that I download it and walked me through how to do it. And he had access to that app as well. And it allowed him to see my phone. To my understanding, it allowed him to see my phone on his phone. So he was able to see contacts, my location, pictures, phone numbers, all of my apps, what apps they were, any notifications that I got. I mean, anything and everything. He could see it. I would even think that with something like that, that you could access like the camera and the speaker and be able to hear conversations. Actually kind of creepy. Yeah. But I think it's important to understand that this is her first major relationship. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And also you're learning because you're a child still. So you're learning how to be in a relationship and you're thinking, well, maybe this is normal. You know, like she said, like he's in prison and so he's sitting there thinking, what am I doing? You know, so she's rationalizing it in her mind like anybody would. I'm going to do this for him so that he trusts me. Like, I'm going to reinforce that trust. Right. And the other thing is you have no comparison. Like you can't go, oh, this is way different than this because there's no other comparison right. to this relationship yet. When did the relationship escalate to something that you didn't like where you felt like this may be abusive? At what point did that start to feel like something was wrong? Maybe around six months, I would get sort of mixed emotions about the whole thing, being unsure about him being able to see my phone and all this information, you know, and and he would question me about things. If he were to see things, you know, who is this? You know, those sorts of questions. Like at one point he had become so suspicious uh, because I had an after school job. I worked for Walmart after school and I would always call him at a certain point and I had stopped calling him at that particular time. And he became certain that I was seeing somebody else or talking to somebody. And he sent someone to my job, my after school job, (laughs) to watch me. I don't know for how long, I don't know for what period of days they did this. I just know that there came a point in which, you know, I got on the phone with him and he started telling me things that only I would know, <laughs> you know, they had hired someone new in this particular time. And I was training him just the basics on how to do the job that we did, which was minimal stuff, but we worked in the same department. And I guess whoever this person is had seen us interacting with each other and Jesse was actually able to tell me uh, what his name was what he looked like 
it was a rough visual. He was a ginger, so I remember him specifically saying that, and that he did know his name. We had to wear a name tag, but he said that they were friends of his, and he had took them there to see if they, if I was doing something wrong, they could catch me. And so there was a lot of suspicion and jealousy and, and trust issues because, okay, now, you know, you've seen you talking to this guy, you must be, you know, who knows what else you're doing. Right. <laughs> um, and not only the fact that he sent someone to stalk me without my knowledge, uh, there were definitely times that I knew that it wasn't good. Yeah. and we'd get into arguments about. Did that scare you? Yeah, that was scary. I guess just the unknown. You know, I don't know who these people are. Does he really know who these people are? Does he fully trust these people? I didn't know. And throughout the entire relationship up to that point, he had pushed me so much. There were moments that I would doubt myself if I actually trusted him. All of the sweet things and the long text messages and just being romantic and overly sexual just makes you kind of just look past it, I guess. It, it doesn't feel as significant as it should. I think that's also part of the grooming process as well. It, one of the tactics for making someone vulnerable for control is to separate them from everybody else. When you're isolated, it's easier to control you because there's no one there to say, hey, this is wrong. It's a tactic that a lot of abusers use to isolate their victims so that they can further abuse them without anybody coming to their rescue or anybody being able to step in. And it sounds like Jesse was really good at separating people and isolating them and making them be alone just with him and doing exactly what he says to do. You were at about six months where you began to feel uncomfortable. At what point does the cat get out of the bag and how does that play out? He had actually at some point requested that I open a P.O. box. And <laughs> I had a friend who I met through the after school job who was over 18. And, you know, he had thought of this whole plan that, you know, I was supposed to tell her, you know, that I wanted it for some other reason and have her open the P.O. box so that he could write letters to me. And on that particular day, I had gone to school and left. I guess I just wasn't thinking, you know, that's the, those are things that I typically would, that I hid. Um, but I wasn't thinking about it and I left it. I think it had fallen on the floor. But my grandmother had come into my room while I was at school and found it. And... As soon as they found the letter, they contacted the Oklahoma Department of Corrections. I mean, I even had it still in the envelope, <laughs> so it had his name on it and his inmate number and where he was sending the letter, for, which prison he was sending the letter from. So they, they called and reported it as soon as they found it. At this point, how long had you guys been together? I don't know. Crystal probably knows that better than I do. <laughs> <laughs> That's, probably, that's probably true. <laughs> Crystal, how long were they together at this point? We started talking January 1st of 2016. Yeah. Yeah, 16. It was reported sometime in October. I can't remember. Uh, the October 24th. Day. October 24th. Okay. Yeah. You said from January to October. So that's almost a year. Wow. Yeah. That's a very long time to be in a romantic relationship. I would assume that when your grandparents found the letter and at some point they confronted you, how did they feel? Were they scared for you? Were they angry with you? What was their emotion? They were worried. Yeah, they were scared. And they didn't understand. It was such a crazy revelation for them to have not known that this has been going on for an extended period of time and you know that I'd actually fallen in love with this person they were worried for me and um, you know asking questions of course they told me that they didn't want me to communicate with him anymore how'd that make you feel it was hard to hear that I was extremely upset 
he had made himself everything to me. Like, it felt like he was in every part of my life. And I felt extremely connected to him. So that was pretty devastating to picture, you know, that he, he wasn't going to, I wasn't going to be able to talk to him anymore, that he wasn't going to be around. Is this somebody that you've connected with over, you know, 10 months? Like that's, that's a long time. Yeah, it was sad. And and actually at that same moment, she was able to give me like the whole court document for both of the cases. And so I was able to read like what he did to Crystal. Oh, at that point you knew what had happened. Yeah. Cause she showed me. How did that um, make you feel? I was hurt. I think it was just like a a double hurt because I felt like someone was being taken away from me and that I loved them. And then I also felt betrayed because he had lied. He didn't even tell me that the grand larceny charge was for his grandfather. You knew about the theft, but you didn't know who he had robbed. Right. And if he did tell me, it wasn't anybody significant. But that was shocking because he always talked so fondly of both of his grandparents. And just so there was also that aspect, you know, he loved this person so much and he hurt them like that. It was all around upsetting. And then I had to first go to him and tell him that my grandma says we're not allowed to talk anymore. And, you know, that she's found out about this. And I didn't know that she had filed the report. Then, of course, there also had to be the conversation regarding the fact that he had lied. And how did he explain that? Like, what did he try to tell you about all of that? He just said that essentially it was, I hate to use the same word that everybody's using. (laughs) He goes something else. Misunderstanding. Yeah, I don't want to say that. Uh, I I felt disgusted saying it as well. I was like, it was a a oopsie. Okay. Uh, (laughs) That word has taken a meaning of its own. (laughs) He he essentially told me that their version of events were different. You know that this is what truly happened. You know, that it was consensual, and then afterwards she decided it wasn't. But apparently to her, that she had came up with this story that wasn't true, but that his story was still true. What he told me was true. Right. So he's, he's the, gaslighting Her version you. of it was untrue, yes. Yeah, he's gaslighting you. Sure. He's telling you, no, you're crazy. You got to believe me. I'm telling you the truth. My story is, is the right story. You know me. <laughs> yeah. Right. And as far as the grand larceny, he was, He got emotional about it and told me how much he regrets doing it, that afterwards it it hurt him so badly that he could do that to his grandfather and that he regretted it and that, you know, he made amends and, you know, he, he was very, seemed remorseful that he had done it and at this point the bigger thing in the room was the fact that my grandparents had just found out and he was worried uh, but of course he didn't want to miss that opportunity to reassure my doubt about the crystal thing and about everything I know now that was would have been extremely important in that moment because he was potentially going to be exposed and and get in trouble so him being able to convince me of what the truth was and also seeming so remorseful and so you know it even brought him to tears how much regret he had over doing that was like a lie and also extreme honesty and um, him being vulnerable like that and, and opening up and telling me the complete truth just sort of solidified it for him right he gave you the complete truth about his grandfather and a complete lie about crystal at the point in time where he's boohooing and telling you that he's so sorry that he did that to somebody that he cares about he never paid a dollar back to his grandfather not a a penny but that doesn't mean he didn't regret it 
that probably was a real emotion. Now, whether he made amends or not, I don't know. Maybe his grandfather forgave him, but I really feel like in Caitlin's explanation of what he did, it's a perfect manipulation. I'm going to give yeah. you the whole truth here, and I'm going to give you the whole lie here, and you know, you're going to go with what makes you feel good. Yeah, He's using enough truth to convince her. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. 100%. Again, that's a manipulation tactic, and he's skilled at it. He's good at it. Plus, it, it serves him well because, you know, again, like her grandparents have reported him which obviously at that point he doesn't know that but it's to his benefit that you continue to go along with what you know his version is caitlin did you feel angry at your grandparents at this point i wasn't initially i felt embarrassed of course (laughs) it was and it has been and it is a humiliation type of feeling but um i didn't feel that way right away after talking to him and letting him know that they knew he advised me that I was to stand up to them and tell them that we were in love and that we were going to be together and that he wanted to marry me and that this was a real relationship and he you know even said to tell them that he said you know, that he would take care of me and that he loved me very much. I mean, he would even say things for me to tell them on his behalf. And, you know, basically just drilled into me over and over again that I was to fight for, I guess, to make her believe or you make her go along with it, that it was okay. Get her compliant and just, I guess, turning her head and not saying anything or going through with anything. And that's a tactic that's worked for him for many years. It worked on the bus when he was 16. He did it with his wife, and now he's doing it in this situation as well. He's saying, hey, go and do this and tell him that it's about our love. you got to fight for our love. So it's a serial pattern. After the point that I had shared it with him, and then he advised me what I was to do from there, I complied and told her everything and she you know met my energy with resistance she was not okay with it regardless of anything that I said you know there was not going to be anything that was going to change her mind that it was wrong that he was not a good person she refused to believe you know regardless if it was me saying it or him saying it she knew he was not a good person and and yeah it it created some feelings of anger and resentment. We didn't get along very well, (laughs) to say the least. It definitely damaged our relationship severely for a while. Prior to that, what was your relationship like? Were you guys really close prior to that? Extremely close. Yeah, I loved her. I I don't have a lot of family. All I have is my mom and my grandparents. That's it. So, if she had always been an extremely important part of my life and I'd always been extremely close to her. And of course, in this period of time, like you guys have been talking for 10 months, you've really gotten to know each other, you've shared a bunch of personal information, you've been sending him things. Did he send you things too? Yes, he did. Were they the same level of like, I guess, value? Is that your answer? (laughs) I don't know that I'd say value, but oh. <laughs> <laughs> like, were they the same level of the type of like pictures and videos that y- that you were sending him? Oh, oh, yes. I mean, they were and they weren't. I mean, I was out here in the free world where I could do anything at any time that I wanted. You know, I I had free will or I had freedom, and so yes, he did send me things, but several times, multiple times, more times than I could even care to remember videos and pictures but it couldn't have ever been anywhere close to the extent that he asked of me did you guys ever do anything over the phone was there ever anything like during your conversations at night yeah that's when a majority of it happened so you know at night he was able to use the phone and didn't have to worry as much about someone catching him or seeing him because it was dark. The lights were off. And uh, 
we would talk at night. And yes, they were very explicit sexual conversations that we had. Most of the time, those were over the phone, just a phone call. There was a point in time at which he had gotten a smartphone. So initially he had a flip phone, uh, but there was a point in time that he had gotten a smartphone. And uh, so we communicated, or we would talk those nights through a video call. And it was the, the same sort of sexually themed conversation, except he could see me. At any point, did he become violent with you in any kind of way where you felt he was being violent? Maybe to some extent, yeah. I didn't have any knowledge that could have possibly allowed me to understand at what level of... Like what would even be considered violent? (laughs) Right. I didn't understand what could be considered violent, you know, sexual things versus maybe rough or aggressive. You know, I had no meter (laughs) as far as what was too far or what was too much. So at the time, it felt like this was probably normal. You know, that the sexual conversations that we had and the aggressive, almost abusive nature of the conversations that we had, I thought that that was typical for people when they have sex. I don't know. I, I didn't understand until now being an adult and understanding that There are things that he liked and there are things that he said and there are things that he, you know, would ask of me that were way too far as far as being aggressive to the point of violence. I think it's important to know because a lot of times people are under the assumption that everyone has their knowledge and their experience. But when you take a child and you put them into a sexual environment where they have no exposure and no sense of what is normal versus what is not normal, it's hard for them to distinguish, is this okay? Is this how it's supposed to be? Because you don't know. You don't have a point of reference. So I think we were at the point where your grandparents found out about it. They filed a report. And I think it goes a couple months before that report has impact on Jesse. What point did he figure it out that your grandparents had done anything? It had been a while. So after me standing up for myself and professing my love for him and, you know, all of the lengths I was taking to defend him, um, she did tell me that she had given the information to the Oklahoma Department of Corrections, to the prison, and that she had filed a report. And so I, I did tell him that. And uh, some time went past before anything came of it. They had confiscated the flip phone that I referenced earlier and were basically going through it to try to find evidence of the crime that she says was committed in. So that, that took some time. I know right after the report was filed, they actually came and... I don't know the appropriate word <laughs> in prison term. <laughs> they call it shaking down your cell. Basically, they searched him yeah. and all of his belongings and all of his property. You know, they, they turn everything upside down. They tear things apart. They go through everything. So he, he did experience that. And then kind of nothing else for a while until they had all their evidence they thought that they needed. And it was you know, he was sentenced to to court. So I know that the filing, it was September 29th of 2017. So in between October of 2016 and now September 2017, you guys are still communicating back and forth. Yes. As frequently? A lot of things have changed about it. The frequency wasn't as often. He was more worried about getting caught. The nature of the conversation was a little more guarded as well. It was definitely still sexual. I don't think that that was something that 
as long as he had a cell phone that he was going to be able to control himself with. But sort of the dynamic of things changed once he had that worry in the back of his head. Was he still pretty lovey and dovey and like romantic and was that still happening or, or did you see a decrease there in terms of the show of affection? I feel like at that point when it first been reported and he knew that, you know, charges are going to be filed as far as being romantic. I, I don't know if I'd use the word romantic, but yeah. he became more serious in his mm. language about our relationship. You know, he had even said that, you know, saying that he wanted to get married and talking about things for the future. So I feel like some of that energy kind of shifted into he was trying to make plans. Right. You know, or like start growing those seeds as far as, you know, this isn't just right here and now. This is going to be forever. Right. And here's how, here's how I want that to happen. And so, of course, at this point, he knows that he'll be up for early release because he'll reach his 85% within a couple years at this point. So he's going to be a little bit more conscious of getting in trouble. At this point in time, is this when he first wanted you to communicate with his family or had you already been communicating with his family? No, I had not until the report was filed. Up until that point, if I had any contact with any of his relatives, it was limited. But I did start communicating with his mother, LaDonna, upon his request pretty frequently. Uh, he urged that it was important, since we were going to get married, that I have a relationship with her and show her the type of person I am. And she knew and how I, old you were, right? She did. Yes, he did tell her. When she met with you for the first time, wasn't that to bring you a ring? Yes. At a stage in the investigation, he got transferred to Oklahoma State Penitentiary. And that is in McAllister, where she lives. So he had told me that he had bought it. I don't know if he had told me prior to you know, him being sent there or, or when exactly that happened. But when I met her for the first time... We had dinner, and she even drove me past the penitentiary there in McAllis. But she did give me, it was an engagement ring. It had a, it had a box and, and everything. And so then after that, of course now, I'm, I'm sure you didn't know this back then, but I know that she met with you again, and the timing of it had to do with kind of how the case was going. Did she have any reason at that point in time as far as why she was meeting you or was it more of just a, hey, let's meet and hang out just for you to kind of connect? That's what it seemed like to me. <laughs> but um, there was some music sort of festival. They played instruments and kind of like an arts fair sort of thing that she was really interested in going to. And I'm sure he encouraged her, but you know, I was under the impression he had encouraged her to take me along with her. And so that was sort of the reasoning for me meeting her the second time. It sounds like you had a pretty decent relationship with LaDonna. Was your vibe from her, like, friendly and motherly and, and caring? Yeah. She was very friendly and very caring. It felt nice to know somebody who knew Jesse. Because now you guys have something in common. Right. I mean, I had always ever just known him and then he knew about my life, but, you know, I had never been involved in any aspect of his life. Of course, I wasn't able to, but it felt good to have somebody who knew him and who supported us and cared about me and cared about him as well. You know, it felt like that one person who was in my corner and who was rooting for me and I didn't have to worry about what she thought or you know what she might say or how she might feel you know I knew that he had her support 
When did that change? Well, we know he's at OSP for about six months. And during the time that he was at OSP, I think there was a, a little bit of a break in communication between you and McFadden, or the communication was a lot less than it used to be. At that point, was there a change going on in you in terms of how you viewed your relationship with McFadden? Yeah. You know, while he was at OSP, they were intercepting the letters. And so it was rare that I really heard from them. A lot of the letters, I'm assuming they threw them away. Um, But they have no access to, obviously, cell phones, but, but not even... Like uh, they call them wall phones, but that's typically how you communicate in prison is calling from the wall phone, which we even did, you know, when he wasn't at Oklahoma State Penitentiary. We we communicated via the prison phones if he didn't have a phone or couldn't use his for whatever reason. But all of that stopped. Not only that, but he now realized that it was very serious. And, you know, I mean, that's our death row is in Oklahoma for Oklahoma prisoners uh, is in that prison. So it's pretty terrifying. I mean, he came from a minimum security, so he was scared. And um, you know why he was scared, right? He's no longer in a prison that's practically all sex offenders. He's now in a prison where a sex offender is going to be a target. Yeah, I'm sure. You know, at the time, I didn't even think about it that way. I think there was also a fear of what was happening with your case against him and what was happening with your relationship as well. I think there were a lot of things going on at that point that he had no control over. Right. And control is a big thing. So big thing. So now he has no control. Now he's kind of at the mercy of the the, the prison. But now he's using his mom to help him. He's trying, but I, I don't think it has the same effect for Caitlin. Did you find some type of freedom there or did you find like that that separation allowed you to begin pulling yourself away from the power that he had over you? Yeah, absolutely. Leading up to that, he had actually told me that he wanted me to deliver a statement basically requesting the Muscogee County Courthouse to dismiss the charges. This must have been prior to him being taken to maximum security, but he had actually written this letter himself and sent it to me. And so anytime I happened to communicate with him, it was constant pressure as far as, you know, he wanted me to print this off. He wanted me to sign it at the bottom and then go have it notarized by notary and then give it to the courthouse. I didn't want to do that. I mean, Every part of that letter from beginning to the end was a lie. He was telling me to sign my name to it and have someone notarize it and me submit it as if it's the truth. I mean, when it wasn't, you know, I made it very clear that I was uncomfortable with that. And it was constantly pushing. He was, he knew that, you know, he was going to get in trouble. And so that was of utmost importance to him was that that be done. And um, I did eventually comply, not right away. It took some time. But after I complied to that, there was some part of me that felt like free because I I had done everything that he asked. Right. So like now you can leave me alone. Right. You know, I felt like this huge burden had just been lifted off of me. I mean, I've been going through so much the last six to eight months, you know. Mm just the trauma of all of it. And I felt like that was all lifted off my shoulders. And At this time, are you still in school? No. During this time period of him being put under investigation and then, you know, moved to Oklahoma State Penitentiary, close to the end of my junior year is where I would have been. And I dropped out of high school. Just the constant stress and the fact that I was having to you know, basically fight with my grandmother who I love, but, you know, I was living in that house and um, there's definitely some contention and knowing that she knew everything that was going to happen, you know, about the trial and she had all this information and that I have him on the other end of the phone, you know, scared about what's going to happen. It was just a lot of pressure and anxiety and just 
I dropped out and I packed my car and I drove to Texas. So I, I was no longer there. What a tough, tough position to be in for yourself to be 17 and to be pulled into this, this mess. Yeah. Just really. Cause you have one side telling you, Hey, this is the right thing that like what he's doing is wrong. And then you've got him saying, Hey, this is really messed up what you're doing to me. It's pulling her like, you know, she's in the middle it's of tough. it. It This is a tough situation. If you've never experienced anything like this, it's really hard because I even know hearing all the things that your grandmother is doing, like she's doing all the right things. She's trying to do the right thing and she's doing her best to help protect you. But in your state, you can't even see it. You can't really see the the forest from inside the trees. Like it's really hard to see what the reality is. And obviously now that you're an adult looking back, it's obvious now. But when you're that child, it's almost impossible. And that's why I asked you if there was any anger because how could you not be? In your mind, you were in love and you were with the person that you wanted to marry and have a family with. And here's your, your family's trying to stop you from that. And you don't understand their perspective yet, you know, and you won't get that until you become an adult and can look back. When you went to Texas, what kind of situation did that put you in? At this point, when I moved to Texas, I moved there because that's what I was familiar with. But at that point, my mother had actually moved to Oklahoma. So for... I think it was maybe three months. I was homeless. I didn't have anywhere to go and I couldn't get an apartment because I wasn't 18. I got my GED as soon as I dropped out. And like before I even turned 18, I got my GED and I was basically going from couch to couch. I, I lived with my father for a brief period of time and then there was a mother of a girl that I went to school with, you know, back in middle school that I could sleep there. I did that until I was 18 and I got a job and immediately got an apartment so that I had a place to live. There was so much anger still towards my grandmother. I feel like more so at this point, it was anger because of all of the stress and all of the yeah. turmoil it brought to my life. You know, and I didn't need that. It was it was a lot. And so, yeah, I was kind of on my own. So that would have been 2018 for you? Yes. So then how does life change for you once you turn 18 and you get your own apartment? And during this time when you're on your own and you're starting to put your life together, what's the relationship with McFadden at this point? Or is there one at all? Throughout that time period, I try to, well, I, I realized the relief that the separation brought me and it made me kind of start to question whether or not I truly still wanted to be in that relationship. If, if the idea of him not being able to have that control and contact over me 24-7 and also me moving away from the state that he's in when I'm about to turn 18, like if those things or thinking of those ideas brought me relief, I started to question whether or not I even wanted to do it at all. And so I was scared of him. I knew that he could be controlling and, and manipulative and that he didn't take no for an answer. And I, so I chose to slowly just taper off the communication that we had together. You know, I'd go from calling you know, I talked to him on the phone from the prison phone, you know, maybe twice a day. And then it was like once a day. And then it was like maybe every other day, which every other day throughout the rest of our relationship, that never happened. <laughs> you know, it was constant, constant. You know, he always had to be talking to me. And so, you know, by the time it got to where I'd go three or four days, you know, maybe I only talked to him once a week. It's... It got scary there for a while. You know, there were two instances in which he threatened me. You know, he'd written me letters on two separate occasions. One was because I had blocked his phone number <laughs> on my phone from calling me. Because even if I only answered once a week, he would still call every single time that they would open up the phones for phone time. So sure. if that was three times a day, he would call me three times a day wow. every week. You know, and I'm not responding to letters he's writing to me and 
honestly, at that point, I wasn't even reading them. (laughs) He had, I believe it was through a text of his mother, but requested that I talk to him. So I unblocked him and talked to him, and I spoken to him, and then read the letter that he had also sent me, and was basically just saying that, you know, oh, you've, you've blocked me again, and, you know, you had promised me that you were going to cooperate, and you told me that you loved me and you wanted to be with me. And then, you know, he mentioned something about holding up each end of the bargain. Apparently, I was I was not holding up my end of what I was told to do, right. you know, because I was walking away. You know, he would give me, if you don't call me by this certain time on this certain day, then I'll have no choice other than to tell my lawyer that we want to go in these certain angles to try to make you look like you're a bad person, essentially, is what he was saying. But, you know, things like just making up stuff, (laughs) you know, saying that I found him, you know, that I was reaching out trying to find older men to date. (laughs) Somehow I was like an older man predator. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I'm scared (laughs) Because like I prayed on him because yeah. <laughs> because I was like had this <laughs> inclination to like older men and so that's how this all came about <laughs> even though I was underage you know and yeah. um, you know other things like how uh, they're going to subpoena you to go to court and if you don't go to court they're going to come find you and they're going to arrest you and then they're going to take you to court and. You know, saying that then you're going to have to face me in trial and, you know, we're going to be there in the same room together. I mean, it was just, you know, trying to make me feel intimidated. Did you know that he was like five foot tall and 120 pounds? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I know. (laughs) At some point in time, yes, I learned that. And (laughs) when you're 16, it doesn't seem like a big deal. (laughs) (laughs) Um, When you're like 18, 19, you're like, <laughs> yeah, I know. There was another occasion, and this was the end of me even giving him an inch, you know, because clearly if, if he got an inch, he'd take it a mile. Uh, but I had answered a call from him after the threatening letter about the subpoena, and if you don't call me and you know, all that. Uh, he called me one day, and, and I answered, said, that he had sent people to my apartment where I was living at the time, my first apartment, and that that these people, I believe he said friends, that they had seen a man leaving my apartment. And he was able to describe to me what he looked like, what his ethnicity was, that he drove a truck, what color it was. That it was a GNC Sierra. He was able to give the exact details of what happened. And this was not information that anybody would have known except for me. At this point, he's not tracking your phone anymore. And so this is genuine. Someone was there. Yeah. I know that you had said that back in 2016 that he had sent you a book about the dark web and then showed you how to use the dark web. Did you at any point in time, so like when this is occurring, because now you've started to get a little bit older, are you thinking anything like, who are these friends that he has because he's a slimy guy? Like I'm, I'm realizing this now. Are you thinking like, did you do something with my pictures, with my video? Is that even part of what you're thinking at this point in time? No. That thought didn't even cross my mind. <laughs> I'm going to be real honest with you until maybe the idea that he could have shared my pictures you know maybe after a year or two of being separated from him probably whenever I was going to go to trial and get on the stand that's about the time that I that I realized that but actually realizing that he very well could have taken them and put them on the dark web but after May 1st is probably the first time I actually had that thought I spent the last few years haven't really been spent processing my trauma. I I was just kind of getting over it, 
you know, just getting out of it and trying to get in a space where I felt like I was okay, but I wasn't really at the point yet of diving into everything that happened and how it made me feel. And, you know, I wasn't there yet fully. When he's sending people by, you know, where you live and he shouldn't know where you live. Are you scared at this point? Like, Yeah. I texted his mother and I, and I said, Jesse just called me and he said that he's been sending people to my apartment and, you know, that he saw, I remember telling her, you know, I don't care if it's a man, I don't care if it's a female, I don't care if it's a dog. He's telling me that he's going to make this person disappear. I was like, I've complied to all of the requests up to this point, but if this is the level that it's going to get to, you know, I'm going to have to to stop complying, basically, submit this information so that I can protect not only my safety, but those around me. You know, I, I was terrified. And so she actually tells you, hold on, let her think about it, right? Yeah, she tells me, you know, not to do it. And she tells you, just do this favor for me one last time, right? It'll just tear her up if he gets more time. Yeah, so I think after I texted her that, she called him. She talked to him on the phone. And he told her that wasn't true. You know, it's a misunderstanding. I never said that. A misunderstanding, man. That's like a huge piece of his vocabulary. (laughs) Yeah. I know. And just that she told him to tell me that I needed to speak to him again, that he could explain himself. You know, I'm sure she had told him that, (laughs) you know, Caitlin said she's going to take all this and give it to the district attorney because you're threatening her and that she did she encouraged me not to say anything and she said I could just ask this just this one last thing if you could do just this one last favor for me she said I would be so torn up if he got more time and said that she really just wanted her son home I trusted her yeah. <laughs> I trusted her I thought she was my friend I thought that she was on my side, looking out for us and me, you know, I, I think that's really one of the last big conversations I ever really had with either of them. Yeah. And, you know, at this point, it's crazy because you're being threatened. You're being groomed by a mom and a son and he's threatening you and she's on the other side pushing you. And this, you know, your case was filed September 29th of 2017. So at this point, like you've been dealing with this along with everything that's happening in your life. And this is a lot. This is more than anyone can handle. And you're doing it like a rock star, which is really impressive because you've put your life together. You've got a job. You've got an apartment. You're doing it all on your own. And you're still dealing with the pressure of McFadden trying to force you to do things that he wants you to do. And his mom is also trying to prod you in that direction as well. I know you said 2019, you were living your best life in 2019. Can you tell me what was different with what was going on with you in 2019 that made things kind of like start falling into place for you? I, at that point, was seriously dating the guy I've been seeing, and uh, he helped me. He knew a friend that knew a lady that owned a company, and it was um, a medical job, but he got me a job through her, and I was making pretty good money for being 19 years old and, you know, only having a GED. And I was taking some courses, but, you know, I didn't have a degree. And I was able to move from the apartment in North Texas, the one that he, Jesse, was sending people to. And I moved closer to the city. And I had found friends there. And... I mean, it felt like I had put everything back together, finally, you know, that it seemed like things were going to be okay. And you did it by yourself. You did it alone. Yeah, I was very determined. I, I always knew what I wanted, <laughs> and, I, and I just went for it. And so during all this, you know, up until this point, you know, you went through a lot of different DAs. You, you had the same judge throughout the process. How did you feel like your case was being handled? And how did you feel like like the DA or the state was representing you? Were they advocating for you? Were they supporting you? Up until the point that they were ready to have the trial, I didn't really hear much. But of 
course, I'd express, you know, um, cooperation. But by the time that it was ready to go to trial, I was over 18 and willing to testify. And the district attorney at the time, she was very involved and kept me updated on things that were happening and the reason for any delays and, you know, calling to check on me. And even whenever I had to give, you know, my statement of the event, it has to be recorded, you know, an audio recording. But she FaceTimed me and talked to me about it. And I felt like she cared. That was really impactful. But after she left, I don't really think the way that I, when you ask me, you know, how do you feel like your case was handled? After she was left, I felt like it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't handled. Right. It wasn't being handled. There, there wasn't anybody that cared. Of everybody that touched your case, she was the only one, and it was during 2019, and I know that she had taken your case on sometime in 2017, but in 2019, something interesting happened. She was trying to accelerate the jury trial, and this was because she was pending leaving and going to be a federal prosecutor. So during 2019, she's trying to close this out and prosecute this case before she leaves the office. And during that year, a couple things occur. She gets a couple awards and it almost looks like it's a little bit of a tug of war of trying to continue to kick the can and kick the can because obviously we know that it ends up just being kicked and kicked, you know, for over five years. So during that process, are you, you know, you've gotten to 2019, you know, you're dating, you're working, you know, you're taking classes. Is this period of time stressful for you? Yeah, it was stressful because it, I had completely done away with that part of my life. You know, I just was living as if that didn't happen to me. You know, it definitely brought up a lot of emotion for me, having to think about it again and having to go over what happened again. And um, it was definitely stressful. And, you know, I, I'm, I have a whole life and I'm five hours away. So they say they want to have a trial okay, well, now I have to go to my boss and, you know, explain to my boss uh, that I have to go to court and they're going to make an odd face at me, which they have every right to, you know, look at me weirdly if I tell them that I have to go to court. When you have to tell your employer that, there is a feeling of obligation to explain so that, I mean, at least that's how I felt. Now, I i mean, I was still young, <laughs> no experience in dealing with going to court or even what the proper way to go about this was. But I always felt, you know, it was uncomfortable. And then you have to have the uncomfortable conversation of, well, I was sexually abused when, <laughs> you know, whenever I was a child. And they just, you know, then all of a sudden it's like, they feel sorry for you. And, you know, they pity you. And I didn't like that. Yeah, I didn't like, you know, having to, go through it again and, and again and not to call them back and be like, well, I know I'd ask her to stay off, but I don't need it anymore. So they've moved it another three months. And so then in another three months, they had to go again and be like, really need to stay off. So yeah, it was stressful because of just reliving what was happening to me and they kept pushing it. So I kept pushing it in my brain. It just kept dragging it right. in my own head about everything that had happened and this impending thing that was over my head at, at all times. And you know, the, the trial was pushed again for a final time just before she left office and it was pushed pretty far out. And then I believe a couple more times before he ends up getting out, but it was pushed twice into like January and then it was, and then from January it was pushed into like June, but then COVID hit and then it was pushed again. So yeah, it was really, it, it just kept getting pushed. And I know what you mean because in your mind, you're ready to get past this, but you can't get past it until after the trial happens. Right. So it was like that finish line keeps getting moved further and further and further away, you know, and you never really get to it. So you never get to put it behind you. It's always kind of lurking there in the shadows popping its head up every couple months. So what was your situation during COVID? I was 
in the medical field. So I was working until, <laughs> unfortunately, even before COVID, the office I was working for was struggling financially. Mm-hmm. But then after COVID, I lost my job because of he just couldn't afford to pay the bills. We saw elderly people and elderly people weren't leaving the house and they certainly didn't know how to do telehealth. That was an uphill battle trying to explain to an 85-year-old how to use their phone to connect to some app and then log in with a password that's attached to an email and then sit on the <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it was... <laughs> um, the work cut down significantly and he just wasn't able to keep up with it and they closed. Mm-hmm. And so for a long period, COVID, maybe six months, I didn't have a job. And honestly, really, at that point, since I wasn't getting any updates from the court, I didn't, I wasn't really thinking about it too much. I'd been, you know, gone, I was able to my brain was able to relax. I kind of let go of that uh, because they never contacted me as far as, okay, the, you know, the trial is going to be this and here's the reason why we've moved it and and all of that. Um, I think I, there was a long period of time throughout COVID I didn't hear from them at all. It was easier to push out of my head than. We know that towards the end of the year, that McFadden's released on October 30th, 2020, and you're not notified, you know, you don't find out until you see a pop-up on, you know, Facebook saying, hey, this might be somebody you might know. And this sends you into like a fight or flight mode to figure out what's going on because you're confused thinking, hey, is he out? And ultimately you end up finding out that they've released him with no probation, no bail and he was actually ordered to report immediately to Muskogee which he didn't do and that's what they ended up being able to get a bench warrant for so he gets arrested and coincidentally he gets arrested on the same day as his attorney passes away and we found him on Facebook or I found him yeah we had to reach out to the district attorney's office and notify them that he was free. They didn't know. Oh <laughs> it God. appeared. It appeared they didn't know. And when I say we, me and my grandma, we both kind of worked on this together, but we called them and someone called me back and they said I was Clint Harris the district attorney, said that that they were going to look into it and that something didn't seem right. And he was going to call it back. I think I waited about five days, six days before he ever gave us a call back. And uh, I don't believe it was him. It was somebody else. Jesse. Jesse Heidlich. That's the only time I ever spoke to Jesse Heidlich. She called and said that, yes, we were right that they had looked into it and that they had dropped the ball, but that a warrant was being put out for his arrest. I guess somewhere along the line, she said that that must have gotten missed and that they dropped the ball and Mm -hmm. she apologized and said, as of right now, he has a warrant out for his arrest. And I mean, me knowing how they work <laughs> and, yeah. and their efficiency to handle things with appropriate timelines. Yeah. I mean, I hung up the phone, probably called my grandma and my mom, and then I called the McAllister Police Department. I mean, I knew his mom was in McAllister and basically said, you know, hi, spoke to the sheriff's office. And my name is Caitlin. I'm calling to let you know that there is a sex offender living at this address and gave them the address and that he is pending two more sex crimes against a child and he has a warrant out for his arrest. And the sheriff said, thanks so much for that information. I'll call it out to the officers out on duty right now. And he said, we'll probably have them by the end of the day. That's what he said. And I was like, great, (laughs) perfect. And uh, I think I had checked OSCN, and yeah, by that next day, he had had been arrested. 
Were you still at home or had, had you left the house? I was home at my apartment. I, yeah, I was terrified. I, it was probably up until that point, like the, one of the scariest moments that, you know, the most I've ever been scared. My boyfriend had actually left to go visit his parents. He was out of town whenever I found all this out. And I was terrified. I would walk around my apartment several times a day and just make sure that everything was locked, that all the blinds were closed. I was terrified to take my dog outside to the bathroom. Day or night, didn't matter. I was very, very scared. I was suffering an extreme amount of anxiety. I'd bitten my nails all the way down to the point where my nail beds were exposed and my fingers were like bleeding. Wow. I couldn't even really use my hands. I was having panic attacks. I was terrified, you know, and, and I was alone at my apartment. Um, I don't have family in Texas, so it was just me. I, I went out and I bought a camera to put outside my door and bought pepper spray to put on my keychain. And it was just the constant hyper awareness of every single thing that was going on around me. You know, if I was walking down the steps to leave the house, I was looking at every single person outside, who's sitting in a car, who's not in a car, what cars are here, check the license plate, make sure it says Texas, move on to the next one. <laughs> you know, it was it was constant. And not even for just that period. It was like that the whole time he was released. I constantly feared for my safety. You're not just worried about McFadden. You're worried about anybody who you might be sending there too. So it's not like you're going to recognize the threat. And so here you are. He's been released, which he honestly never should have been released. And you're having to be ODOC. You're having to be the DA. You're having to be the sheriff. Like you're doing all these jobs for them. Yeah. You know, as the victim. Someone's got to do it. All while being terrified. Yeah. It's, you know what makes me the most sad is that we've gone over a span of years from 2016 all the way to 2020. And since 2017, you've been terrified. You've constantly been in a state of extreme fear. And I can't imagine being terrified for that long. And, you know, the impact that that's got to have on your, on your psyche is, has got to be intense. Caitlin, I know, I know there's been some changes, but so before everything occurred on May 1st, of 2023. Had you already had to seek therapy over all of this? Yes. I had actually saw a therapist even when he and I were still communicating near the end before I moved to Texas. I was diagnosed with a generalized anxiety disorder, also acute depression, as well as PTSD from constantly being in a state of fight or flight for as many years as I was, it causes so much intense, severe anxiety in situations that you wouldn't even expect. It was a constant part of my life. It affected me mentally and emotionally and also physically. I have a lot of physical illnesses that have came from that PTSD and the anxiety from it, just constantly having anxiety. I suffer with a lot of issues with my stomach because I'm overproducing all this acid from being scared to death. <laughs> you know, it, it makes it hard to eat. It makes it hard to lay down at night to go to sleep because of how sick I feel in my stomach. And that's still something that I suffer from. So your life's been completely altered even still with experiencing those things, you were still doing everything that you could to ensure that the right thing happened as far as he was concerned. How did all of this impact your dating life? It made it extremely difficult for a number of reasons. Number one, because I struggle so hard with anxiety. It makes it hard to even leave the house, just the fear of walking out the front door. But you know, even beyond that, the idea of meeting somebody new. I don't know this person. They're a stranger. And I've learned that, you know, that could be bad, that things could happen that I don't even realize could happen. 
it made me very hesitant to form connection with men. You know, I get anxiety or worried even just at the thought of a man being sexually interested in me to the point where I put off going on dates. I I don't want to do any of it because I'm terrified at the idea that they might want to have sex with me. (laughs) And (laughs) I know that's maybe vulgar, but, uh, you know, it's it's the truth. It stops me from having relationships because I'm not only intimacy, but even emotional intimacy seems Trust has been horribly violated. It's, yeah, it's, it's stressful. I'm, I try to avoid it. <laughs> I feel as if I don't know what's going to happen, you know, or I have to let myself be this vulnerable person that I was in that moment back whenever I was a child and someone took advantage of it. And I'm always afraid that that could happen again. When you're supposed to have your trial, so this last trial that was scheduled, were you excited? Were you thinking like, finally, this is going to be it. We're going to go do this trial and it's going to be done. It's hard for me to think about the word excited, <laughs> you know, given everything that happened. But I was ready. I was prepared to wake up that morning, to drive there. You know, I, I packed my bag. I was relieved. A little bit scared because of everything I was going to have to do, you know, get on the stand and he was probably going to be there. They both were, him him and Holly. Going to have to go over evidence of, you know, where they show me my test printouts of of my abuse. That was scary. And then, of course, all the anxiety that I have now because of everything he put me through. And now I'm leaving the house and I'm getting in my car and I'm driving, you know, all these hours to meet these people that I don't know. It was scary, but I was so ready to do it. I just wanted it to be over with. You know, I was tired of carrying around this burden. And I also knew that he had been reaching out to minors or mine. And so I was motivated to do everything that I could to have him put away. You were preparing for war. You were ready to go to war with McFadden. And I know in your mind you were thinking once we get out of this trial, he'll be back in prison and I'll have some type of security at that point. Did you have that confidence with all this pushing that he would actually even go to prison? Honestly, yeah, I did. Because there had been so much deliberation. We had been in the trial stage for, what, two and a half years? And so... I would go back and forth with district attorneys and then his lawyers saying, you know, (laughs) they would offer him, okay, they offered him 20 years. And then his lawyer would come back and say, well, he'll do 10, but all probation. (laughs) 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 I can assure you. And there were some talks of five years in and five years out on probation, strict probation for sex offenders. But nonetheless, you know, he wasn't going to do more than five years in prison. And this trial is what was going to get him more than five years in prison. If I stood on the stand and if I told my story, he could get life. That was a jump that I was willing to take. And when I decided to make that jump, it was because I thought that he was going to be put away for good. And what a brave thing to do to head into that alone with the intention of putting him away you could have very easily just accepted a plea and said, like, let me just get this over with. Right. Give him the five years. I'm going to go about my way. And But no, you were ready to fight that out. And that's amazing. And that's incredible that you did that. Thank you. It's, it's hard to... Sometimes it's hard to feel uh, proud of myself for doing that these days. I know that I was doing it because I had the right intention. So the night before trial, you get a message. From McFadden. When you got that message, were you thinking this is another one of his, like, to mess with me, to push me to before the trial? Or were you thinking there may be some, some type of real threat? Is your brain even going in that direction? No. From just reading it, I mean, that's the only communication I've gotten from him and, you know, significant amount of time at this point. I initially was confused <laughs> because I, you know, read it. I read it again. I read it again. And, you know, I didn't 
fully understand when he says, this is all on you. You know, my first thought was, I guess my only thought, because it all happened so quickly. You know, it was the night before and the next morning. And, you know, my thought in that moment of time was that, you know, he had listed all of the great things he was doing uh, with his marketing job. And I thought maybe he was referencing that, that I was, now it's all gone. Like, now you're taking my life away from me. You know, I was able to do all these things and now they're all gone. You know, my job and wife and you know, now I'm, I'm not going to have any of those things anymore because you're taking them away from me. I thought he was trying to make me feel bad and manipulating me to try to have a sort of conversation with him in which then he was going to try to manipulate and or threaten me to not testify. So then at this point, you forward the message to the DA. And what does the DA say back to you? Yes, yeah, so got the messages. Pretty late, fingers around 8 p.m. And I saw them like 10 minutes later pop up in like my message request on Facebook Messenger and maybe spent about three minutes reading it, but screenshotted everything and sent it to him. And he thought I did write to him. Just wanted to let you know, Jesse has reached out to me on Facebook. You know, he sent me these messages. And uh, I want to say, you know, an hour or two went past and he uh, never called, but he texted back and he said, okay, <laughs> that's what, that's all he said. So then at what point after you send him the messages, do you become concerned? You know, we wake up the next morning and the trial is supposed to be that day. And he calls me at 1030 and tells me 1030 a.m. on the 1st tells me that Jesse's lawyer asked for a continuance based off the fact that during this entire time, Jesse's had him retained as a lawyer. He's never requested any of the cell phone records between he and I, which is, you know, everything that has to do with the reason why we're going to trial that day. And uh, that they were requesting to have it moved. And he had warned me of it the night prior that that could potentially happen. I talked to him on the phone earlier that evening. So I, I expected it, to, to be honest. And so I just said, okay, fine. And I hung up the phone and he called me back maybe 15 minutes later, uh, no more than 30 minutes later. And he said, I don't want to scare you, but I was just informed or they just put out a news alert for two girls in Okamulgee County. And he had said their ages and that they were last seen with Jesse. Then it all starts to make sense in my brain, you know, the message and, and everything. And I also want to mention, because I didn't mention this, in the phone call that morning, uh, when he had said that they were going to push the trial due to lack of information, I brought up the text messages to him again during that phone call. And I said, you did get the screenshots that I sent you last night, didn't you? And he's like this, screenshots and I was like yes there's screenshots about Jesse reaching out to me and there's like moment of silence and then he's like yes yes I did see those thank you for sending them to me and I was like okay I was like well wouldn't that be a violation of his bail or like can't he be arrested now because he's contacted me the victim but I mean that you can't do that (laughs) and he's like (laughs) he's like yes you're right you know just Again, uh, doing their job. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Uh, he was just like, you're right. I'm going to call them right now and tell them that, you know, they had violated his bail and that they were going back on it and that he had to go to jail. At some point, one of the DAs shares with you over the phone that the phone that was taken that had the pictures and video and everything with you in it that is evidence that there was other underage girls on that phone. Did they ever, did any of the DAs ever tell you why none of that was introduced as evidence, regardless of whether or not any of those girls wanted to be a witness? No, it wasn't ever explained. And actually, after that DA, it was never mentioned again. Uh, She only mentioned it to me one time, one of the last conversations I had with her. But nobody else ever mentioned that there could be other girls that had been abused. So then the next message you get from 
the DA is what? And he calls you, right? Yes. He calls me like 30 minutes later and about the Amber Alert and that they didn't know where he was, that they were looking for him. And you know, I spoke to him several times that day. They put out a bolo for my county. So in case he was happening to be coming here, that someone would be on the lookout for the type of truck that they said that he had and what he looked like. I had gotten an Airbnb about an hour away from my home and I was driving there so that, you know, he wouldn't know where I was and that I was safe. Um, it was, it was on the, the way there that I got the phone call about what had happened. I, you know, I, <laughs> it felt like I just kept having to remind this guy that he had reached out to me and I was frustrated. To me, that seemed important, you know, and I just, I kept like wrestling in my head with this and it just felt ridiculous that I even had to call him. You know, I would have assumed that this would have already happened. You know, where the Henrietta Police Department would have called me and asked to talk to me and somehow, you know, try to make some sort of negotiation. I mean, if I was the last contact he made and he has these girls and he knows where they are, <laughs> I mean, I'm not a police officer or a district attorney or a judge or a sheriff. Oh, but, but you have been. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. but in my experience doing all of those roles, I mean, that would have been my first <laughs> inclination would have been to arrange some sort of like a like a rescue operation right. <laughs> to try to help communicate the information back and forth and make some sort of deal you know if you you know we'll i'll drop everything if you get them back you know uh, anything and i you know once again call the district attorney and i'm like i just can't get it out of my head that he sent me those messages last night they mean something you know i didn't know it last night but i know now they mean something you know i was like can't you contact them and give them my number and tell them to call me and he said yeah well, i did that this morning um but they really didn't seem interested uh, once they realized you were out of state, they kind of just lost interest. I think they're just looking for people that they can sit down right now and talk to in person. So he's reached out to you and there's no concern that you can possibly reach back out to him and have a conversation to convince him that he's not in the situation that he's thinking he's in. Yep, they weren't concerned. It wasn't, uh, apparently they didn't think it was important, according to Larry Edwards, the district attorney at the time. Um, I said, regardless, can you please call them again and tell them this is my cell phone number. You can call me right now. I will answer. I had pulled my car over, <laughs> pulled off the highway, you know, probably 50 minutes away from where I was, from my home, where I was going um, to make this phone call. And I said, I want you to call them and tell them I want to speak to them. I mean, there has to be something that can be done. I, I didn't get it. You know, and I felt that something was just pushing me that you need to push them. That's why I made that phone call. And he said, OK, I'll talk to them and I'll give them your number. You know, hopefully they'll give you a call soon. So now you're hostage negotiator and your lead investigator at this point in time. <laughs> After hanging up that phone call. I got. A call from Larry Edwards again about five minutes later and. He said, did you see the news? And I, I was pulling it up on my phone as the words were coming out of his mouth, you know, and I read it at the same time that he said it. And um, that's, that's how I found out. It was awful. I felt guilty because like the the very last feeling that I had had prior to finding this out was feeling so frustrated with their inability to do anything right and that I was basically trying to force their hand to try and do make something happen and so from going to that sort of mindset to everybody is gone and then knowing that he had texted me that, I just cried for probably 
24 hours I was in that parking lot until I was able to call somebody and ask for help. I just kept thinking that I was stars. I felt like I was saying sorry because even though I tried so hard, it wasn't enough. I believe if everybody else that was involved in this investigation would have tried half as hard as you did, we probably would have had a different outcome. You know, the other feeling was anger. I would just cry and cry, and then it would just be like a flash of just so pissed off. (laughs) So angry at the fact that they let this happen. Not only did they let me get abused, They left me my entire rest of what I could scrape together of my childhood. And all of my life up to this point left me feeling like I wasn't important and like what happened to me didn't matter. They never let me feel like a victim. And then they let him be a free man so that he could take all their life. I was was, and I still am very angry. It's complete incompetence or just cruelty. I, I don't know which one. I honestly probably both. I think the one thing that we could depend on throughout the whole case was that they would do the opposite of what they were supposed to do. Even when they were investigating the crime. I'm not as close to this as, as you are, Caitlin, and it makes me angry. It's hard not to think that it's intentional. Caitlin, what changes after all of this, would you like to see happen? Many of them. (laughs) I think that the state of Oklahoma and their victim protection, their victims laws that they have, I think that they need to be updated, changed, and they need to be enforced and taken seriously. I think this isn't the first incident and this, this won't be the last of something happening because of their negligence. You know, I think that they need to be thoroughly investigated, all of them, the judges, (laughs) the district attorneys, the assistants, the court clerks. I mean, something is wrong there. 100%. I think that the state of Oklahoma should be held accountable. They did. 100%. And I guarantee you that this isn't the only case like yours. Yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure there are more that we we just don't know about, and they, they owe it to me and to the families of those children to explain all of the lies and how they messed up and in some way pay for what they did. Truly, that, that's how I believe. Um, whether it's losing their jobs or whether it's getting in trouble for things that they covered up or that they didn't do, that they did wrong, or that they're, you know, whether it's a monetary reason, they, they deserve to be held accountable in some way. And they're expecting not to be. And that makes sense, especially when you listen to the case and you see how quiet it's been for the last month, like nothing. Which is not normal. (laughs) No, it's not. It just screams corruption. And you know, one thing that's so sad to me is that in addition to Caitlin, his first victim also wasn't notified when he was released. And she didn't find out until she saw the news about the deaths. So one major thing that I think that they need to change is you shouldn't be allowed to leave the courtroom without signing a refusal in front of a judge and a notary to not be contacted as a victim. To me, it just seems like a basic victim's right to be notified when the person who harmed you is being released from prison. You're the highest at risk at that point. It's crazy to me that the person that broke the law has more rights than the person who didn't. That makes me mad. What advice, Caitlin, would you give young girls or boys who have been in your situation or who currently are in the situation that you've been in? What would be your advice to them? My advice would be to trust your gut feeling and that if you never had that gut feeling and now you're in a situation where you feel like you can't get away, that it's okay and you don't have to feel like it's your fault and that you, you can get away from it. You're not going to be stuck there forever. 
to, you know, to let somebody know. And what would your advice for parents be? My advice would be to be cautious because they're out there. Like the ones from your worst nightmares, they exist. And just to be cautious that there could be a chance potentially that your child could come in contact with these sorts of evil people. And, you know, to make sure that you've created a safe and stable place around the idea of not only communication, but communication about sex and the stability to where if something did happen that they thought maybe wasn't okay, that they could come to you and that they could ask you or that they could tell you. I think it feels easier to just brush off the whole idea. You know, that's never going to happen or, you know, that that would never be the case. They, they would tell me. But just to educate them on on what it might look like. That it might look like a normal person, but but what might be some signs that would be concerning and that if they were to ever experience anything like that, that they could tell you and, you know, that they weren't going to get in trouble, but that, that they would be safe and taken care of. That's really good advice. Yes. It resonates and it reminds me um, in our interview with Crystal Strong, one of the things that she said is that that's how she raises her kids so that she knows that they can bring anything to her, and she, if she doesn't know about it, she can't help them. Very, very good advice. Your story is so incredible. The courage that you have is, I can't even begin to tell you how many lives you're going to touch with your story because there's girls out there who are going through exactly what you went through right now who need to hear your message, and the fact that you're willing to share it is just incredible. So thank you. It took me a while to get where I am. (laughs) It wasn't easy getting here. You know, I wasn't ever made to feel like I was a victim. I wasn't ever given the the care that you would give a victim. So I didn't ever really view myself like that. It's taken a lot of growing to get here and I wish it, I wish that it wasn't because of everything that happened, but. You've been very strong in everything that you've done. And what's most impressive is that you've always done it by yourself. You've always, you know, been alone in the struggle of doing whatever it is that you needed to do. And you've always been the one fighting even for everyone else when people aren't doing the right thing and trying to get them to do the right thing and be held accountable. And so Crystal says you're strong. It takes strength to be vulnerable and to share your story. It takes strength to face a monster like McFadden in court when you don't have to. It takes strength to be willing to expose yourself in terms of trying to negotiate some type of a recovery of the children when they were missing. All that takes strength. And that's one thing that you've displayed over and over again is just strength. Even when you were 17, you dropped out of school and went and got your job and got an apartment. Like that takes strength to do those things. And that's one common common thing that in everything that you've done, you've been strong and you've been resilient, super resilient. And not just that, but despite everything that you've been going through in the process, like depression is one of the most debilitating illnesses that you can have because it can make you unable to get out of the bed, to leave the house. And you still fought through all of that. And that's extremely courageous. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your story, Caitlin. Thank you, guys. And that's a wrap on today's investigation, fellow detectives. If you found this episode both enlightening and captivating, then please subscribe to our podcast show and our Patreon. Leave a review and hit that like button. Share our podcast with others and engage with us on our website and social media platforms. You can find us on all major podcast platforms as well as our website at www.bodyofcrimepodcast.com where you can access all of our episodes and bonus content, including valuable resources. By expanding our community, we believe we can make a greater impact in our pursuit of truth and in shedding light on crucial cases. 
If there's a case that you'd like for us to cover or a personal story you'd like to share, please don't hesitate to contact us through our website. We always welcome your feedback and suggestions. Until next time, stay sharp, and thank you for tuning in to the Body of Crime podcast. Podcast. Bye.